The United States would absolutely decimate Russia if Damn. war broke out between the two nations. Straight to the point. That's the opinion of David Petraeus, a former CIA director and four-star army general who says that Russia launching a nuke in Ukraine would lead to the US stomping Putin into submission. But there's a caveat to that claim. See, that's the thing, they can't, even though they're in war with Ukraine, they still won't launch a nuke because the madness that will cause, there's, they got a pact or like a contract to say you can't launch that like that. Petraeus says that the US would lead NATO in a collective takedown of every conventional Russian force, from battlefield equipment to naval, that is stationed in or around Ukraine. What he doesn't say is that if it was a one-on-one -on -one fight between Russia and the US, with all of their individual forces focused solely on each other, that America would come out on top. Would it though? That's an interesting it, question, though? as the world's two largest superpowers colliding would inevitably lead to a world war that involves almost every ally that either country could muster. But if we could create a hypothetical battlefield in which the two countries fight alone, would the US have what it takes to defeat Russia? Or does Putin have enough tricks up his sleeve to take on America? Let's find out, starting with the most obvious point, the size of each country's military. According to Global Firepower, the US and Russia rank as numbers one and two respectively in Duh. terms of the sheer size of their militaries. Starting with the United States, it has 1.832 million military personnel, 1.39 million of whom are on active duty and not part of volatile paramilitary groups. The vast majority of that military is for all of those salaries just being paid consistently. I mean, they're protecting the country, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, that's a lot yeah. of money. There's a lot of money in war, which I was yeah. just saying the, on my last video. It's crazy. Just on the ground-based army, which boasts a little over one million members spread across active wow. and reserve duty. But the Air Force and US Navy are no slouches, with both having hundreds of thousands of members. The US also has a ton of equipment. A staggering 13,300 aircraft, with 9,975 of those being combat ready, Fuckin join 5,500 tanks and over 300,000 vehicles, along with impressive stocks of artillery. On the naval side, the US has 484 assets, including nearly a dozen aircraft carriers and 92 destroyers. It has nuclear-capable submarines too making its naval fleet a terrifying force. How do you even stack that many bloody vehicles? And that? Do you know how mad that is? That is crazy. They must have um, storage. Yeah, loads of it. Like man. underwater in the sea. They must do. Just where they, everywhere. Where are they keeping it on the land? Don't know, man. It's just nuts. I don't get how they can have so much. It's yeah. crazy. Both on the surface and below it. These are amazing numbers, but Russia isn't too far behind. Global no Firepower points out that it has 1.33 million military personnel, with 830,900 of those on active duty. That leaves 250,000 as reserves, and a similar number in paramilitary groups such as the infamous Wagner Group that Moscow essentially controls. In the air, Russia does seem to fall behind substantially. It has 4,182 aircraft, of Still which Global lot. Firepower estimates around 2,000 are combat ready. And the Russian Air Space Force, VKS, has a few hundred thousand fewer members. Russia also has less military vehicles, 151,000 to America's 300,000. Do you think if like a country like Russia, could be another country as well, ever took over like the US numbers, like in terms of power in the army, do you think they would ever try like kind of control the world in a way because as we know us kind of controls everything because of their military force and no one really fucks with the us like that but do you think if a country kind of overtook the us comfortably in terms of that number do you think they'll carry on what the us is doing and kind of take over the duty i don't think it's or just about think... number though i think it's about technology technology like important. for example in the last video that we watched the technology that the us have for their aircraft was crazy like Russia can't match it. None of these countries sound, sound so. Like they do. I don't think it's just about numbers. It's about the technology but the country think, has as well. Well, another thing that, that I could say is some of these countries might be like China. You know, these countries are uh, Japan or all these Asian countries are known to be quite technological. Do you think they might be developing technology that might surpass the US? They just not announced it. They might be waiting for a big. 
Especially to Because you, know so you know these countries, they're like, they're high in they're technology, hit, right? Yeah, they they, and they, they're not going to announce all their new tech, especially when it's like war related. Yeah. They're leaving that shit for a surprise. I mean, we don't know. Like look at COVID, that shit was meant to be exp- uh, made in a laboratory and it mm. leaked. That could have been, that could have been one of the technologies that they were saving for warfare. Yeah. Don't know. Though it comes out on top with tanks, as it has more than double what the China. US boasts. China. Its navy is China. bigger too. Trump. Russia has 598 assets that it can call on, though the spread of those assets differs from the United States. It only has one aircraft carrier, for What's instance, that, yeah. and a comparatively paltry 15 destroyers compared to America's 92. Yeah, that's what well, numbers yeah. are about level. In the navy, they got no they, chance. They'll get finished, I'm sorry. <laughs> navy, yeah, and there's even no air, point of trying. Even the air force is a lot less than the US. Mm. Though America wins out for nuclear capability. Even though they're number two, they're not they're close so like that. behind. Yeah. And that's number two. In terms of quantity and technology. technology. Mm. But Russia has impressive numbers of corvettes and is likely more capable than the US when it comes to conducting mine warfare. If war were won on pure numbers alone, the US would be the clear victor. Yeah. It has more of almost everything from personnel to equipment. And even in the naval area, where it lags behind, you could argue that America's focus on more attacking vessels gives it an advantage. But sheer numbers alone don't win wars. Both the US and Russia can tell you that. They have each found it difficult to win wars against much smaller countries, as we saw clearly in Vietnam and are currently seeing in Ukraine. So pure military might isn't the measuring stick for a conflict between the two. We have to dig deeper. Starting with the ground game, both have similar ground force setups. For the US, its infantry squads form the backbone of its armed forces, with its light infantry being divided into air assault, mountain and airborne units. Each light infantry squad consists of nine soldiers, divided into a squad leader and a pair of fire teams. Each of those fire teams has a lead, an automatic rifleman, typically carrying M4 carbines and an M249 automatic weapon, a grenadier and a rifleman. Soldiers may also receive AT-4 anti-tank weapons if the situation calls for it. Mm. Mechanize one of those infantry units and you see the addition of both the Striker and M2 Bradley fighting vehicles. Most interesting here is the new generation of Strikers. That looks like something out of Halo. If you know, you know. That's a ha- Halo truck right there. Which come equipped with either a powerful 30mm cannon or the United States' ace in the hole, the Javelin anti-tank missile. That missile gives the US a mid-range option for taking out tanks that could prove especially useful given Russia's reliance on them as combat vehicles. Russia's equivalent of America's mechanized squads is its motor rifle team, which will typically come equipped with either a BMP-23 or BTR-82A combat vehicle. Those vehicles have seven-man dismount teams, all armed with a pair of PKM machine guns, an AK-74M rifle, and a short-range RPG-16 anti-tank weapon. Those PKMs are starting to get a little dated, though Russia is in the process of switching them out for the updated PKP. However, the motor rifle teams... Like you said, technology. I bet America's just at the top of all the updated guns, all the updated stuff. Like, America's probably just got it already. They pay Even... bucks yeah. to the so scientists, the creators, to create all this for Just them. to keep developing yeah. new shit lack a comparable anti-tank weapon to the Javelin, giving the US a slight advantage in that area that would otherwise be more or less equal. However, Russia does come out on top in terms of the sheer number of infantry it can field compared to the United States. Mm. Its infantry contains a trio of vehicle platoons, including an extremely mobile airborne unit that enables it to field about 25% more soldiers than the US Army, according to the national interest. Theoretically, that gives Russia more tactical mobility on the ground, especially compared to America's light infantry that is marching on foot. Russia can reach objectives faster and deploy more people when it gets there. But you know, like, on foot, I get that, but the US got so much air power, like... If they, Which if can they got, get somewhere fast as well. If they got bloody jets just dropping bombs from the sky yeah. and just fucking dropping bombs non-stop, all your shit on foot is getting blown up, but it doesn't matter. But I think what the purpose of this video is, is that it's comparing everything. I know, but just generally in a war, like I think the Air Force is way more effective than your war, like your ground game, just yeah. generally in a war. 
you've got pilots just dropping bombs everywhere. What can you, you could be underground, you're getting blown up, you're getting blown to the smithereens, mm. you know what I mean? And that's why America made sure they got the most powerful air force and Which they spent- undetectable as well. They, they made sure, because they know they can't let anyone take over that, mm. otherwise they're in danger. But that increased deployment isn't all it's cracked up to be. When Russia loses one of its vehicles, it loses about a third of its combat power that's Damn. built into each of its squads. By contrast, the US loses about a quarter because it has so many infantry members already on the ground. Combine that with the Bradley's better armor and superior firepower compared to Russia's BMP, and you have another slight edge for the US. Throw the javelin into the mix, and the US has more than enough firepower to take on Russia's superior they deployment heavy. capabilities. <laughs> of course, there are <laughs> caveats it's a on both job. sides. Yeah. They the look first big. is that neither country's infantry would fight alone. The battle wouldn't be a case of stacking infantry units against one another. Mortars, air support, artillery, and so much more would be added to the mix, meaning that ground-based battles would be determined as much by tactical nous as pure firepower. Terrain is the second caveat, with Russia's effectiveness potentially being curtailed if battles were fought on terrain that favors foot soldiers, given its heavy reliance on vehicles. However, you could also argue that Russia would have the advantage if ground battles were fought in colder climates. And of course, each would have... Russia's used to the snow, because it snows a lot over there, so they obviously condition their machinery for that stuff. ...of a home field advantage of knowing their territory if the war encroached into their own country. So, there are factors at play beyond firepower. Though the US likely comes out on top in a ground war, it's better equipped and has more infantry, even if Russia has superior deployment. We see a similar story when the battle takes to the skies. Here, the US has a clear advantage for the simple fact that each country uses its air force differently. Russia tends to focus on small-scale operations with its air force. It typically uses its planes to offer support to its ground troops, with bombing runs tending to be conducted at low altitudes. That approach creates a great risk of planes being shot down by anti-air artillery, as we've seen to great effect in the Ukraine war. According to the RAND Corporation, Moscow has lost between 84 and 130 of its aircraft by August 2023, with the real number likely being higher. In that's mad, Ukraine's taken out a lot of their fighter jets already. And that's Ukraine, imagine America. And look how small Ukraine is as well compared to Russia. You know what it is though with Ukraine, they're just getting so much support from other countries, so yeah. much financial backing, so much equipment. Like the US and the UK and all these countries, they sent them so much military guns and missiles to use. Like mm. it's crazy. So they, if they don't have the support, they would have been wiped in my opinion ages ago. In fact, the same group says that Russia may have lost between 27 and 57 aircraft by simply pushing too many of its aging aircraft into longer service. Maintenance is almost as much of an issue as the caliber of its pilots and the approach it takes to aerial battles. By contrast, the United States focuses on composite air operations, or COMEOs. This approach can bring anywhere between 20 and 100 aircraft into a single operation, wow. usually taking place over a large geographical area to achieve an objective. Those craft will vary, with some providing reconnaissance and support, while others attack more directly. Why is he rubbing it? Don't know. Why is he rubbing it? Is That's... it gonna make... Maybe he just appreciates fine art. Come on, girl. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Or is there more to it? Let us know, guys. Creating a multifaceted <laughs> approach to air-based warfare that allows the US to not only cover large patches of land, but also fend off other aerial forces. Granted, Comeos often include aircraft from multiple countries working together to achieve a goal, but it's likely that the US would still employ this approach when fighting Russia on its own, especially given the sheer volume of superior equipment that it has. And equipment is another major win for the US. Equipment. Russia has Tech. a large number of Soviet-era aircraft, including its MiG-29s, MiG-31s, and Su-27s. It also uses Su-30s, which were introduced in 1992, making them over 30 years old. Granted, these craft have generally been modernized as much as possible, making them capable of modern air-based warfare. But they're still old aircraft, with a lot of flight miles recorded and relatively few left. They're like cars, flight miles. They've got to be considered, because obviously if they're flying in the air and it's, oh, yeah. it's been rinsed. Especially when you're fighting for your country. Yeah, it blow up. Air service, yeah, oil you change, all of that. Imagine that on a fighter jet, the cost of that. Yeah. It's not like little cars that we nope. drive. Left in the tank 
Of course, these aren't the only craft in Russia's lineup, as they also have the more modern MiG-35 and Su-35 fighters to call on. But neither is as advanced as America's best fighters, and Russia's war in Ukraine has shown that it's increasingly reliant on older craft to conduct its air operations. In comparison, the US largely uses the F-16 and A-10 fighter jets, which have been in operation for about 20 years. They're starting to show their age too, though they don't have as many miles on the clock as Russia's older <laughs> stock of Soviet-era fighters. However, it's in the process of introducing the F-35A Lightning II into its fleet, a fifth-generation fighter jet. The F-35A would likely be the trump card that America could deploy in an air battle that it should already dominate simply thanks to its superior tactics. Imagine learning to fly one of those. Like, imagine going into like cool. flight school for these and becoming like an Air Force flight uh, pilot. I, I, I think I would actually... You know when I was younger, I said to my mom, I want to be part of the Navy. And she said, no, we're just going to die. And I was like, oh, okay. Fantastic. Yeah. They're very strict though, because um, I know someone or knew someone who in the UK wanted to be a pilot for the army. And the RAF. I don't know. I don't know the technicalities, but she, she, uh, it was a woman. She wanted to be uh, part of that. And she passed all the health checks and everything. But then they measured her. And apparently her arm reach was less than the requirement. So she couldn't do it. Oh, my God. Because you have, they're very... Strict. Yeah, like the requirements are very high. Like, although she passed all the health checks, because her arm reach wasn't long enough for what they want, they said you can't. Oh. Yeah. Mad, isn't it? Because you can't adjust the seats. I don't know if it's anything to do with that, but I don't know. Yeah, if she can't reach it. No, but I, I, don't, I think there's more to it. It's not. I don't think it's just so. In you terms can't of reach. like movement, I, or... I don't know if, if you're in high combat, they just that's their one of the requirement. You need a certain reach, mm -hmm. just generally. So the battle on the ground is fairly even, but the battle in the skies should be in favor of the United States. That was even pointed out in 2020 by a Russian tech billionaire named Mikhail Bolshakov. In an article published on the Russian news website Vuzgliad, he pointed out that Russia does have the Su-57, which it claims is superior to anything that America has to offer. But where production of the Su-57 is faltering, at best, America already has 500 F-35s, compared to the tiny squadron Mad. of more modern fighters that Russia has at its disposal. There's no use in saying that something is better if that something barely exists. For the United sure. States, it could assume that Russia would deploy similar air tactics to those in Ukraine, and those tactics would represent opportunities given the wealth of anti-aircraft options that the US has compared to the soldiers on the ground in Kyiv. The US is looking pretty good so far, but the battle may start to turn in Russia's favor once the Navy comes into play. Imagine being one of those foot soldiers with the bazookas or... Like, obviously it sounds bad, but imagine how the feeling of fucking launching this thing and taking out a fucking rush, like Russian or vice versa fighter jet. Just, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but imagine just the adrenaline and the feeling of just going, boof, and you just land it on a, on a chopper or something. That must be crazy. Like that, I can't even imagine what that would be like. I mean... Like in a real war and you're just there with this you fucking... You have to have no emotion. you got to just be cold. Calm, no emotion. Just like, like this is just my job. Like Yeah. Literally, this is my job. Yeah. That's what I'm getting paid to do. Yeah, that's crazy, man. After all, global firepower's figures from earlier show that Russia's navy is larger than America's. Though the US is no slouch, yes, it... Did I just hear Russia's navy is larger than America's? Because... On our last video, I got grilled for saying Russia had a navy. So many people said they don't even have a navy. And then people were arguing, saying, oh, they have a navy, but it's small and it's outdated. This guy just said Russia's navy is bigger than the US. Did I hear that correctly? That's what I heard. You lot comment below the actual, what you lot got to say about that. Because if I got grilled, this guy got to get grilled as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm not getting it. grilled on my that's own. That's true. You got to go to his video <laughs> as well, guys. Don't just cuss us, all right? We, we're watching it and reading everything. <laughs> These guys don't know what they're talking about, but this guy just said it himself. <laughs> and look, we're learning. We're educating ourselves. That's why we're yeah. watching this video. So the guy said it, not me. Mm. It has fewer naval assets, but those assets tend toward being more combat focused than those deployed by the Russians. Still, you can't underestimate Russia's capabilities in this area. 
Yes, its navy focuses primarily on smaller patrol boats and corvettes, neither of which present much of a threat to America in a blue water scenario. The deeper you go into the sea, the more America has the advantage simply because of the strength of its destroyers. However, Russia could play a different naval game. While using some of its large ships and submarines to distract America's bigger combat vessels in deep water, it could deploy its smaller vessels to coastal regions. No, that sense. would be a problem. Corvettes yeah. and patrol vehicles are capable of attacking ports and launching smaller attacks, especially once they've drawn in close to a target. They're also more agile than the larger destroyers, meaning they'd present a clear threat to commercial vessels that aren't equipped to fend off attacks from any type of ship. And though the Pacific Ocean would be a huge barrier to these small ships, Russia's proximity to Alaska, its Providenia port is just 250 miles away, could prove a route in. Attack Alaska, establish it as a naval base, and launch from there. Of course, the US would have something to say that about this approach. While that, that proximity boat. is an issue, it would also create a bottleneck if Russia relied on it alone to get its ship closer to the United States. Its smaller vessels would be sitting ducks for America's fleet of destroyers as they cross the Bering Strait. So that would be unlikely to happen. And according to Marine Insight, there's a good reason why. As with its air force, Russia takes a different approach to the United States with its naval forces. Russia is all about strategic deterrence. It uses its navy primarily to keep others away from Russian territory rather than to actively attack in deeper seas. That so they use their navy more for defense, while America has the offense mm -hmm. on the navy. It's interesting. That's Which not makes sense because America has the technology to And the firepower, yeah. yeah. To say it's incapable of blue water combat, it's just not as capable as the US, which would make using its navy to prevent America from landing in Russia via sea a smarter strategy. Mm. The United States, by contrast, relies on power projection and is much more likely to deploy its navy into deep waters to combat Russia. It could also use its fleet as launching points for the Air Force's Komeo That's attacks, what I was watching. get one of its dozen or so aircraft carriers in close, Carry and on. American fighter pilots could take to the skies to attack Russian ports or even conduct simple reconnaissance. The only area where the two countries are approximately equal is in nuclear-powered submarine capabilities, and it's here that Russia could claw back some ground. According to Newsweek, Putin has been improving Russia's underwater capabilities for years, with the crown jewels of that fleet being the Imperator Alexander III and the Krasnoyarsk. The former is capable of carrying up to 16 of Russia's Bulava Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles ICBMs, giving it the ability to launch heavy attacks from deep waters onto US territory. Putin has been bullish about his subs too, having said in December that he'll be commissioning more nuclear submarines in the future to ensure Russia's security for decades to come. Putin knows their air force, they lose, so he's like, what's the next best thing? Really, the next best thing is the underwater, right? If it's not the air, it's under the water. It's one or the other. Those are like the top two. I think it's to do with... Because obviously humans create technology. Mm. It's to do with their scientists that create all this. Mm. Like, for example, with the States, they've definitely employed some genius to create all this technology. Yeah, of course. Whereas this is what the uh, Russians are slacking on. Yeah, but I'm sure Clearly. Russians got their own people as well. It's just, I guess... But in terms... I'm talking about in terms of create... Like, for example, look at Elon Musk. Innovation. There's basically. only one Elon Musk that can create what he creates. Yeah. It's the brain power. It's, do you it, know what I'm trying to say? It's an innovation behind the creation. And yeah. It's a good point. And this is what the Russians are missing out. For example, let's just say the person that came up with all these innovations for the US went and worked, I don't know, for Russia. Russia would they'll create the same thing. Similar for thing, if yeah. not, yeah. It's a good point. And yeah, innovation is very important, especially when you're it's the creating people new that technology. Are behind this, yeah. creating this stuff, they haven't got the intelligence to create what the states have. I'm sure they're very intelligent. They are working on projects. But not but, up to the state's yeah, level. And the thing is, the US has a lot of funding, so they'll pump, they they print money initially, so they'll pump as much money as needed to yeah. these guys to create. And obviously, they'll give them objections of what they're trying to, what the object, objective is at the end of the project, and it's up to them to deliver. Mm. Of course, the US is no slouch in the nuclear submarine department. All four of its main operation classes of subs, 
the Virginia, Ohio, Los Angeles, and Seawolf are all <laughs> nuclear powered. And in the case of the Ohio class, the US has 14 submarines that are capable of launching ICBMs of their own, according to the Nuclear Threat Initiative. So a naval battle between Russia and the US might US come down to that. where that battle takes place. Deep sea battles seem to favor the US, where more coastal conflicts may be the domain of Russia. Still, the US might have a slight advantage here, simply because it has more aircraft carriers, creating the possibility of better cooperation between its navy and air force. But none of that matters if either country runs out of arms. Assuming the battle between the US and Russia becomes a war of attrition, which is likely, barring one potential outcome that we'll get to in a moment, keeping troops stocked up will be essential. Every destroyed vehicle, sunken ship, and destroyed fighter plane will take its toll, with near-constant military production likely being essential. Not to mention all the ammunition and small arms that would be needed for ground combat. Right now, the US stands apart in the arms production race, at least in terms of producing weapons for other countries. Apparently, America was one of the, if not the biggest, arms dealer around the whole world because they produced the most guns and stuff, so they were just supplying different countries and surprised. selling. Yeah, it, they must make crazy profit. Yeah. Crazy. And then they pumped that money into their army. Back into the art, back yeah. into the development and innovation and stuff. Yeah. According to Axiom, the US produced 40% of the world's arms exports there we between go. 2018 Mad. and 2022, in addition to keeping its own military well stocked. That's leagues ahead of Russia. Though That's still in nuts. second place, it only accounted for 16% of exports during the same period. Of course, the caveat to these figures is that Russia is engaged in a war with Ukraine right now. It's not selling as many weapons because its own forces need them to fight mm, that war. That's a good so point. So it's no shock that the US has leaped further ahead. But further is the key term here. Even before the war in Ukraine, the United States sold and produced more weapons. Between 2013 and 17, the US accounted for 33% of all weapons exports, with Russia hitting 22%. Closer for sure, but there was still a considerable gap there. It's an inexact measure of production capacity. And it's not like Russia doesn't have the ability to ramp up when it needs to. As recently as September 2023, Reuters reported that Putin has ordered a cranking up of production to keep Russian troops well equipped, even in the face of increasingly strict sanctions being placed on Moscow. According to Bekan Ozdoev, who is the industrial director of Rostec, which manufactures most of the country's weapons, production of various types of weapons has increased to between two and ten times previous numbers. He also pointed to increased production of tanks, rocket launchers, artillery, and ballistic missiles. Duh. All of which should be harder to produce given the sanctions placed on Rostec. Even the United States Treasury recognizes how important Rostec is to Russia, dubbing it the cornerstone of Russia's defense, industrial, technological, and manufacturing sectors. With Rostec firing on all cylinders, Russia would be able to keep pumping out weapons simply because it's a state-controlled corporation that Moscow ultimately controls. The US doesn't have that luxury. Its weapons come from private companies that are under government contracts. If Russia were to really fire on all cylinders with its weapon production, could the US match it, or would it get wrapped up in bureaucratic red tape and contract negotiations that could delay its weapons production? That's quite a madness. So Russia got their state, well, their country owned the production, and US get private companies to produce. That's really interesting which I'm, I'm i'll be honest i'm very shocked about that with like the power of the us and you know how not war hungry but how like ahead they are with like the army and stuff i would be i'm very surprised they contract that out to private companies and don't have their own you know their own subsidized company that they own i'm very shocked they go to a third party for that uh, i think it's due to do you think it's due to technology? What's in what in what way do you mean? Like for example, they go to third parties. Do you think it's because these third parties have this technology which the US require? And Maybe, want? but that's why I'm surprised they didn't just kind of And this goes back to my what I said earlier that how example the Russians are behind in innovation. Yeah, but that's because they're developing. The what country are these third parties? They're in the US. Oh, they're in the US yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. From the sounds of it, they're in the same country. But that's what I'm saying. I'm surprised the US government hasn't brought these companies together yeah. and said, "We're going to fund you lot like crazy and just 
you're under us officially. But I guess because there's a lot of money in war, you know, these part, uh, private companies must be charging crazy of money. Of course they are. And they're making so much money that maybe, they, maybe they've been offered it and they're like, nah, we want to stay private because... We're making the money like is this. way more yeah. like we don't want to be under you guys. Yeah. Maybe that's what it is. It's hard to say, but ultimately the production lines won't matter if either country launches the biggest weapons in their arsenal, the nukes. Russia and oh, the US lead the way go. in nuclear weapons and it's not even close. According to the Arms Control Association ACA, Russia has an estimated 5,889 nukes to America's 5,244, oh, giving it a slight edge. Of those nukes, Russia has strategically deployed 1,549 of them, while the United States has 1,410 ready to go. The reality is that Russia having a slight edge in numbers here is ultimately meaningless. Both countries have more than enough nuclear weapons to destroy the other many times over, yeah. meaning mutually assured destruction would come to fruition if either was brave or stupid enough to launch. Still, there is an element that might tip the balance in Russia's favor from the nuclear perspective. Let's see. The RS-28 Sarmat, dubbed the Satan II by some military... Is that the weapon that we saw in our last naval, uh, Navy video where America was like, if you, when you're not allowed to launch that? I think that's that weapon, Maybe. you know? Uh, the first name before this Satan II looked familiar, and I think it is that. Do you remember they gave the warning to Russia yeah. saying, if you look to Iran... It was to Iran saying, um, if you launch that weapon, we're going to have a problem. And then they brushed it under the carpet in the end. It sounded like it was that. Correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but it did sound like it. Very experts. The Sarmat missile system Sarmat. entered combat duty in Sounds September familiar. 2023 and can launch nuclear warheads further than any ICBM of its kind. Its range is somewhere in the 11,000 mile region, oh my with God. Moscow claiming that each missile can carry 15 warheads. Washington disputes that. It claims the number is closer to 10, but it's the range that's the really worrying part. Russia can launch a nuke from almost anywhere and hit the US. America doesn't have that capability. Its closest equivalent to the Sarmat, the Minuteman 3, can travel up to 8,000 miles, according to the National Air and Space Museum. Impressive for sure, and far enough to reach Russia, but the ICBM is outdated compared to the Sarmat. Furthermore, the US Naval Institute reports that America has only tested the Minuteman 3's range up to 6,000 miles, meaning mm. 8,000 may be a stretch for the aging ICBM. So they don't know if it could even reach that 8,000. How many miles is it from the US, from one side of the US to the one side of Russia? Is it over 6,000? If it is and that war kicked off, they need to hope that shit hits. I mean, the Russian one travels for 8,000 miles and it will hit. So... Six thousand, that's two thousand, that's a lot less. I don't think... It'll probably just go at the edge. But that's what I'm saying. Even if it hits Russia, will it hit the beginning of Russia? Or can it go further to, like, other yeah. parts of Russia? Because it seems like Russia could literally launch it. I think it'll be the it. beginning. But also remember, Russia's a massive country. That's what I'm saying. They need, well. they need yeah. distance. So I'm surprised they haven't upgraded that shit. Yeah. They need to get that on point. Where's Elon Musk? <laughs> um, even the Minuteman 3's intended replacement doesn't outperform the Sarmat when it comes to sheer range. The upcoming LGM 35A Sentinel isn't complete yet, so its specifications aren't public knowledge. However, Air Force technology estimates that the ICBM is expected to have a range exceeding 5,500 kilometers, which mm. is about 3,400 miles. That's less distance than the Minuteman 3 and about a third of the range of the Sarmat which would put the US at a nuclear disadvantage. The caveat here is that exceeding 5,500 kilometers could mean that the Sentinel could go much further. We just don't know yet. The key is that Russia can now fire from land almost anywhere in the world and hit the US. Anywhere the in the nuke. world. Of course, America's air and nuclear submarine options mean it could launch a counterattack at any time, potentially making the point moot. The only thing for sure is that if one country went down the nuclear route, the other wouldn't be far behind the entire world would suffer the consequences. Yeah. With nukes in play, Ain't the no battle between the US and Russia could come down to which is willing to fire first. But if we take nuclear weapons out of the equation, it's clear that the US, by and large, has the advantage. It has more troops, more equipment, and a far more advanced air force that is not only tactically superior, but equipped with better aircraft. On the naval front, the battle is a little more even. Though the US has a stronger attacking force, particularly in deep waters, 
the smaller boats in the Russian fleet grant it more mobility in coastal areas. And so we come back to the question that kicked off this video. Could the US beat Russia on its own? The yes. answer is probably yes. Assuming Russia is fighting on its own as well, bring Russia's allies into the fray and you may have a whole different story. China, what do you I think, think? one of them. Does Moscow have tricks up its sleeve that would help it to overcome the sheer firepower that the US has available? Or perhaps there are weaknesses in tactics or equipment that would mean the US isn't quite as strong as it appears to be. Tell us what you think in the comments below.